Hi everyone, uh, I'm John McCutcheon and thanks for coming to my talk, Control, Configure, Monitor and View Your Game Engine from the Web. So my talk uh, is broken down like this. Uh, I'll start off with an introduction and then go into some examples and then I'll talk about uh, the justification behind some of the decisions I've made and uh, what I'm proposing. I'll talk about some technical notes and uh, then wrap it up. So I've classified engine tools into two uh, larger categories. The first category is online tools, and these are tools that run inside or alongside the game engine. Uh, some examples are, you know, modifying the state of the game engine, controlling the game, configuring it, monitoring performance, or viewing the game itself. The other class of tools uh, are offline tools, and these uh, are tools that run outside of the game engine uh, or disconnected from the game engine. Typically, these uh, would be things that process assets and things like that. My talk is focusing uh, on online tools, but the ideas that I'm presenting are applicable to offline tools. So let's just get into it. So some problems with online tools uh, are that they require a capable in-engine GUI. Um, and because they're part of the engine itself, they can have very long iteration times uh, doing a recompile and relink phase. Uh, they can be a little bit difficult to use when developing for consoles, and the user must be physically nearby. So the solution to this is my proposal. Let's move the tools into the web browser, uh, where it's very simple to create rich GUIs with uh, modern uh, HTML5 browsers. Iteration tops, times drop dramatically, and the tools work over the network, which means the developers don't need to be physically nearby, and console development becomes very similar to PC development and there's more benefits which I'll discuss later. So in a nutshell, this is what I'm proposing. We have web applications which communicate with the game, uh, with the game engine through message passing or remote procedure calls. So let's just jump into some examples. I'm going to talk about asset preview, live performance monitoring, live editing, and a remote viewer. So I've broken down assets into uh, different classes, textures, meshes, sounds, and models, which are just a combination of textures and meshes and shaders. Uh, I won't actually be discussing sounds because I really don't know anything about audio programming, but it's something that would have to be considered. So for asset preview of textures, the web app would, would request the texture data from the engine, and the engine would send this texture data back. Uh, then the web application could render them in an HTML5 canvas with uh, texture coordinates visualized on top and uh, MIP level selection, uh, interactive MIP level selection. For meshes, uh, the web app requests the vertex and index buffers associated with the mesh. The engine sends them back only one time because the web app then loads them into a WebGL, VBO, and IBO, and which are cached for future use. And then you can just render them in a WebGL context. So models uh, are kind of taking the textures and meshes and, sh uh, and combining them with your actual shaders that you use in the game. So this would give you a uh, realistic asset preview. Um, but this an extra step here is that it would require authoring shaders for WebGL. Depending on whether or not you're using OpenGL, this may or may not be an issue. The other issue here is constant buffer data. Uh, it must either be transmitted from the engine back to the uh, web app itself, or a description of this constant buffer data could be sent, and a dynamically built GUI for modifying the constant buffer data could be displayed inside the web application. So for live performance monitoring, uh, I've chosen to back it by a push service, so the client, the web application subscribes to updates and sets an interval uh, as to when it wants to be updated. And for CPU performance monitoring, my engine sends the most recent frames user markers. Um, and for memory stats, the engine sends a memory allocation count and uh, bytes for all registered allocators. So here's a screenshot from the Chrome browser's debugger showing a subscription request. The command is reporter.subscribe and the reporter name is memory graph. The engine would reply back uh, with a response in this case would be an array of allocators of which I've expanded 
the font allocator, and you can see that I've sent across the number of allocations, the bytes allocated, and then the high watermarks for both of those stats. Along the bottom, there's some boilerplate stuff, which I'll get into uh, later on in the talk. So here's a screenshot of a live memory usage graph. Uh, along the bottom, you can see the, the legend for the different lines on the graph. Uh, each indicate a different allocator that's been uh, being tracked. So for live editing, uh, so long as your game objects are identified by unique string names, then web app can create new game objects and modify game object properties, um, like the transformation, the render model, collision shape, etc. I'm really not sure what the best user interface for this is. I think it really depends on the game and what you're trying to accomplish here. So the final example that I'll talk about is the remote viewer. Uh, and this is uh, streaming a video from your game engine to a web browser at interactive rates, and in turn, streaming the keyboard and mouse from the web browser back to the game engine. I took the simplest approach, uh, and it worked reasonably well. So the approach is that the web app requests a JPEG frame. Uh, the compression rate is part of this request, and the engine compresses the frame buffer and sends back a JPEG frame which the web app displays. This is repeated in a loop. I chose this approach rather than having a push approach because I wanted to allow the web application to rate limit the frames being sent across. And uh, you know this avoids the problem of the engine sending more frames than the network can handle. And there's no backlog of older frames which you don't even want to display because there's a fresher frame available. So here's a screenshot of the remote viewer. This is the web application side of it. Um, this is at the lowest quality uh, possible. So you can see with the uh, text rendering that there's a lot of uh, JPEG artifacts there. So looking at the same screenshot but bumped up to a 50% quality level, most of the artifacts go away and uh, the display is, is good enough for, for what I, I'm concerned with. So some some numbers associated with this. Uh, for JPEG encoding of a 960 by 540 frame buffer, it was, uh, it was averaging between three and four milliseconds to encode the frame. Of course, this could be done in a separate thread, and you're, as, so long as you're JPEG encoding one frame behind, your engine won't be impacted by the uh, extra cost of JPEG encoding. In terms of the uh, client side uh, frames per second, at the lowest quality, the web app was running at 40 frames per second. But as you saw in the screenshots, that 10% quality, it looks pretty bad. Um, but at 50% quality, uh, the app was running at 30 frames per second, which I consider to be good enough image quality and uh, interactive enough as well. Uh, in terms of bandwidth, a medium quality frame is about 64K. So at 30 hertz, that's looking to be about 2 megs per second which works fine over local Wi-Fi with my testing, but it's clearly too much bandwidth for streaming over the internet. So that wraps up the examples. Uh, I have a video uploaded to the web of the live image streaming, uh, which there'll be a link to at the end of the talk. Now I'm gonna switch gears and kind of explain the justification or the thinking behind my choices here. So I'm gonna talk about why I chose to move the tools into into a web application, why I chose to use WebSocket as the uh, network layer, and why I chose to use JSON for encoding messages being sent back and forth between the web app and the, the game. So I'll answer uh, all of these questions uh, with why web application, so let's just get right into it. So in terms of deployment, uh, a web application is much nicer than a, a native application because the tool itself is hosted in the cloud. Uh, rolling out improved versions can be done transparently, and at any point in time, the developer can just refresh the page and get the latest version. Uh, for less uh, finished tools, they can be hosted by the developer themselves, and once the tool is complete, it can be migrated to the cloud. Another benefit of web applications is that they're far more approachable to non-programmers on the team it's much less intimidating to kind of hack up a JavaScript and HTML application uh, than it is to edit a bunch of C++ code and rebuild everything. It's 
far less error prone as well. So uh, another benefit of a web application is that there's easier control over console targets. So for those of you who don't develop against uh, consoles, that you, you might not know that they are separate machines and they don't have keyboards and mice plugged into them, and so you're kind of remotely controlling them from your development PC. So what happens is a lot of games have their, en their engine tools controlled using an analog stick and the buttons on the controller, which is kind of awkward. Also related to this is remote access. Consider the scenario where you need to show your coworker what you've been working on, but she's on the other side of the building or just can't really come over right now. With a web application with remote streaming, you can just have her connect and stream video from your game instance to her browser, which is pretty sweet. So another benefit of, a side benefit of making it a web application is that since the interaction between the tools and the engine is expressed through message passing, it becomes scriptable. And this doesn't just have to be scriptable by a JavaScript application. Many other languages have WebSocket clients and it's not that difficult to write WebSocket clients for whatever language you want to use if it doesn't have one already. Potential use case for maybe a non-web application, but still using the same back-end interface is constructing automated unit tests for your game. So a script could communicate over WebSocket and set up game objects, play the game to a, the test state, and then request a screenshot. The screenshot could then be compared with a good screenshot. So finally, uh, I, I believe that web applications are the future. I don't know if I'm unusual, but I primarily use web applications now. My programming tools are the only exception at this point. Further to this is that Windows 8 will be offering native HTML JavaScript applications. The browser is getting faster and more featureful at a very fast rate. I mean, just two years ago, we didn't have WebGL and Canvas and WebSocket and all these cool features that are showing up in web browsers every few months. Um, so there's a lot of momentum here. And some of you who have experienced JavaScript might understand that there's a little, JavaScript can be difficult to structure large applications with, but there are languages like Dart and a CoffeeScript that are attempting to make this a little bit better. So the second uh, big choice I made here was to use WebSocket. So first of all, I'll talk about what WebSocket is, and then I'll discuss some benefits of using WebSocket. So WebSocket is a new protocol available to web apps. Uh, this protocol was just finalized in December 2011. It's available in Chrome version 17 and many other browsers. It's best thought of as really just a TCP connection um, with just a little bit of overhead, a few bytes for every message sent. It allows for both text and binary data to be transmitted back to a web browser. Uh, the only difference really between a WebSocket and the TCP socket is that WebSocket is message based. So you, that means that you're always given the entire message and never a portion of it, which actually makes it easier to work with than TCP. So WebSocket allows for bi-directional communication, meaning that both the server and the client can be sending each other messages at the same time. If you would wanted to accomplish this with using HTTP, it would require two connections, one for upstream transmission and one for downstream transmission. WebSocket is very bandwidth efficient. Uh, the header uh, associated with each WebSocket message is between two and 14 bytes. It's very efficient and simple to parse this header. And it, in contrast, HTTP headers are never that small and require string processing to parse. So there's also a latency reduction um, versus HTTP. WebSocket is just a tiny abstraction on top of TCP, so the latency is about as minimal as you can get. So finally, I chose to use JSON for my remote procedure clone methods. Uh, for those of you not familiar with RPC, uh, it's best thought of as a function call over a network. In my case, I'm using it to make calls between the web browser and the game engine. So first I'll talk about what JSON is, and then I'll talk about some benefits of using it. So the acronym JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation, and it's actually JavaScript code, uh, which browsers can serialize and deserialize from 
JSON into actual objects running inside JavaScript directly. It, it is the native web, web data structure. So the features of JSON are key value maps, uh, arrays, and support for numbers, strings, and Boolean values. So it's pretty expressive, um, and there's not a lot of data structures that you can't represent inside JSON. So one of the benefits of JSON, the primary benefit, is really parsability. Humans uh, can read JSON simply because it's a text-based uh, data definition with very little markup. In that case, it makes it easier to read than XML. Uh, programs uh, can also parse it very easily. Writing your own C++ parser is simple, and there's about uh, probably a thousand of them available on GitHub right now. And most importantly, browsers serialize it, deserialize it directly, so it's, it's built into every web browser out there. So now I want to talk about some technical notes uh, that kind of describe on a more detailed level uh, what, I, I, what I've been doing. So I'll talk about a WebSocket server, uh, my design for the JSON remote procedure call interface, integrating all of this into my engine and building a web application. So in terms of the WebSocket server, I'll talk about connecting, message transmission, and the design experience I had with it. So connecting to WebSocket server consists of accepting a TCP connection, receiving a WebSocket upgrade request, and responding to this request. So I'm not going to discuss how you accept a TCP connection, but when you get a WebSocket upgrade request, it looks like uh, this box here. Um, it's an HTTP request. Most of these fields are obvious or self-explanatory, but the weird one here is SEC WebSocket key. And what this is, is it's a connection challenge from the client to the server. The client wants to confirm that you are, in fact, a WebSocket server, and you need to construct a reply based on this key. So let's look at the reply. So again, most of these HTTP fields are self-explanatory, but the SEC WebSocket accept is your response to the, the key challenge. How is this uh, field calculated? Well, the details are in my alt dev blog article I posted a few weeks back, so if you're interested, you should go and check it out. It's fairly straightforward, but most importantly, after you've done this WebSocket upgrade request, then this TCP connection is no longer operating in HTTP mode and it's operating in WebSocket mode. So how do you transmit messages uh, in a WebSocket connection? Well, all WebSocket messages are framed with a header, which is between 2 and 12 bytes long. There are two classes of messages uh, supported by the WebSocket protocol. The first is control messages, and these currently consist of pings, pongs, and a close message. The second class is non-control messages, and these are the actual text and binary messages that your application is sending and receiving over WebSocket. All messages are masked with the 32-bit masks. These masks must be unpredictable for security reasons, and the mask is applied simply as a ZOR operation to the payload that you send. So non-control messages, these are the text or binary messages, can be sent in chunks, chunks that must be reassembled. I've never actually seen this, but it's something that you have to keep in mind if you're going to write your own WebSocket server. So let's look at the header. Um, Primarily, the header is a set of bit fields. The first field is a final fragment bit, which indicates whether this is the final fragment of a larger message. There's some reserved bits, and then there's four bits to express the opcode, uh, which is the type of message that this is. So if you look in the lower right hand of the screen, you can see the opcode table. Uh, so opcode 1 is a text message, opcode 2 is a binary, opcode 9 is a ping and A is a pong. There's also a mask present bit, which indicates whether or not the 32-bit mask is present at the end of the header. Following the mask present bit is the payload length, which is a 7-bit length field, and it kind of does double duty here. If you look in the upper right, you can see that if the payload length, the 7-bit field, is less than or equal to 125, then the extended payload length uh, in orange is not present. If it's equal to 126, then there's a 16-bit extended payload length, and if it's equal to 127, 
then the extended payload length is 64 bits, allowing you to send just ridiculously massive messages. So in terms of receiving messages uh, and sending messages, it's just a matter of constructing this header, which is fairly simple to work with, and then just sending it down the TCP connection along with the payload. So while writing my own WebSocket server, uh, I had some I had some design advice for someone who wants to do it themselves. Uh, I found that it was much easier if each instance of, web, of the WebSocket server is responsible for handling only a single connected client. Uh, this has the benefit of making uh, resource allocation uh, and management very simple, uh, and you can use a higher level system to manage multiple connections. My WebSocket server has a single update method, primarily so that there's a very controlled uh, mechanism to trigger the processing associated with the WebSocket server. So nothing is going on in the background that might interrupt the, your frame. Uh, when the update method is called, any queued outgoing messages are sent. All incoming messages are received and parsed. Uh, pings and pongs and connection closing are also handled. Another thing that uh, another choice I made when designing the, my WebSocket server is that all message processing is delayed. So the update method just queues messages to be processed and the higher level system, your game, gets to decide when it wants to handle these messages, which makes it very easy to integrate into your main loop in an unintrusive way. So now I want to talk about the JSON remote procedure call uh, that, I've, that I've designed. It's fairly simple, but first I'll talk about RPC and then the JSON RPC. So for those of you not familiar with RPC, uh, at first uh, I'll just remind you that a local procedure call, uh, like something done in a C or C++ program, the function name, the parameters, and return values are all identified with memory addresses and register locations. Whereas in a remote procedure call, this function call is ostensibly between two machines. So the function name, the parameters, and the return values must be marshaled or encoded for network transmission. So I chose to use uh, JSON as the uh, encoding for this network transmission. So here's an example message. Uh, the curly brackets indicate a key value map in JSON. So uh, the keys are type, command, and ID. The type of this message is a command message. The command that is meant to be executed is the memory.stats command, and the ID is 50. So the only mandatory keys in my RPC framework are type and ID. All other keys are optional. The reason why the ID key is mandatory is that this is how function call and returns are linked. So if you send a message with an ID of 50, when the game engine is sending the reply to that message, it will also have an ID of 50, allowing very simple uh, linkage between a call and a re reply. So the type of message indicates, the type key indicates the type of the message. And you can see that I support three message types in the purple table. There's the command, which is a function call or larger request. Result, which is the result of a command and a report, which is a repeating message from a subscription, which I'll have more on later. The ID, which I've already discussed, is a unique identifier for each message, and I just use a monotonically increasing number for this, so it's simple to generate them. The ID only has to be unique per connection, not locally. So now I want to talk about integrating this into my engine, uh, which consisted of the command center, connections, commanders, and reporters. So the command center uh, has three responsibilities. First, it manages multiple connections. So my engine supports multiple connected clients, and these clients can actually communicate with each other using the engine as a hub. The command center also has a registry of available commanders, and uh, a commander is responds to a set of commands. Uh, it also has a registry of available reporters, and reporters maintain a set of subscribed connections and send regular reports to the subscribers. So as I've already discussed, each connection is backed by its own WebSocket server instance. 
and it has an incoming, outgoing, and message buffers. And the set of connections is held by the command center. So the command providers are the main provider of my engine tools API. So they enumerate the handled commands. Uh, as I've said, one commander can handle many commands. And I've settled on a commander.command syntax. Some examples would be memory.stats or memory.dump. The, when handling the commands uh, in the engine, it gets the connection and it gets the parsed JSON object and can optionally send a reply back to the connection. Reporters are a push service, so connected clients subscribe to a reporter and then configure the interval that they want to get a report on. And the reporter sends the report at that interval. Uh, the nice thing about a push service is that repeated requests from the clients uh, is unnecessary. So finally, I want to talk about uh, the web application. And I'll talk about sending messages, handling result callbacks, and the user interface. So my web application, there are four ways to send messages. The first is fire and forget. And this sends a, a message back to the game engine and just ignores any response that comes back. The second is a fire method, which takes the command and a callback so the, the callback is registered so that when the server sends back a message with the same ID as the command had, then the callback gets triggered. To subscribe to a reporter, uh, you just provide the reporter name and a callback to be called whenever a report arrives. And similarly to unsubscribe, you just specify the reporter name that you'd like to unsubscribe from. So getting uh, at command return values, when a message arrives from the server to the web application, the ID in the message is looked up in a map from IDs to callback functions. If no such ID is registered, then the message is just dropped. Uh, if a message, if an ID is registered, then the callback is called and the message is passed in as a parameter. This is probably not the most efficient way to go about it. I think I may change my system so that the message the fire and forget messages indicate that they don't expect a reply. This should save some bandwidth and computation on the engine side. So the, the UI for my web application, I guess this is somewhat uh, unique in that my HTML actually has no content in it. Everything is dynamically generated by uh, JavaScript. Uh, and uh, the HTML just consists of a bunch of div tags. So I've been using jQuery UI, uh, which is a really nice uh, widget toolkit library available for web applications. And they have things like buttons and tab widgets and many other things. There's also a lot of plugins on top of jQuery. I've been using HiCharts, which, uh, I, which is an off-the-shelf dynamic graph widget. You saw a screenshot up earlier, built on top of jQuery. And I also have a command terminal built into the application. And for that, I took the jQuery terminal library. Uh, for, for 3D asset preview, I've been using WebGL. And for uh, custom performance marker graphs and things like that, I've been taking advantage of the HTML canvas. So in conclusion, I'm proposing three steps. First, create an API for your engine tools. Second, expose this API as JSON over WebSocket. And then three, build engine tools as a web application. HTML5 is very powerful, and it's becoming more and more pervasive. Just, you know, in the last couple of years, we've had WebSocket, WebGL, Canvas, jQuery. These are all mainstream pieces of technology now and allow you to develop really cool applications inside a web browser. I've had a lot of fun playing with uh, JavaScript, which is a prototype language. Uh, it allows for duct typing and component style design uh, just natively, and it's fast enough for many application types. And as I said earlier, the browsers keep getting faster every year, so the more and more application types will become suitable for uh, being built inside a web, web browser. So these are the tools that I've been talking about moving into a web browser. Uh, first of all, they should support multiple connected clients, remote viewing, live editing, live performance monitoring, live configuration, and live asset preview. 
some future work that I'd like to do uh, is, first of all, a port to Dart. I found JavaScript to be kind of messy and unstructured, which has its benefits, but as an application grows, it can be kind of unwieldy. Dart just seems like a better language for complex applications. A downside of Dart is that no browsers support it right now, but the Dart compiler outputs JavaScript. I'd like to investigate a better streaming video solution. The JPEG frame solution was really easy, and it worked surprisingly well, but a real video codec might be better and allow for streaming over the internet, and not just over a local network. I'd like to extend this idea to uh, pipeline or offline tools and turn asset processing into a service so the developers can submit assets through a web application. I'd also like to experiment with uh, scripting the game remotely. So I, uh, the big question for me right now is, is it feasible to put the game logic into the web browser and communicate the results of that back through uh, WebSocket over JSON? I'm not sure if the latency will be too high or not, but I, I want to play around with that. So for references, I've uploaded a YouTube video uh, that you can go to my website and see. Uh, this video shows uh, the remote viewing capabilities of my web application. It's fairly shaky because I filmed it on my cell phone, but I hope it gets the idea across. I have two alt blog articles which go into a lot more detail of what I've been discussing. Uh, the first is writing your own WebSocket server, and the second is controlling your game over WebSocket. So for a lot of the other things that I've been talking about today, I suggest you use Google and uh, check things, do the research yourself. Thanks. Thank you, Jan. <clears throat> so before we go into the QA session, I'd like to remain, uh, remind everybody that the recordings, slides, materials, and additional materials will be available after the conference. Hopefully that should be sometime next week. So the first question that I have is, are you planning to make uh, part of your implementation, either the embedded server or the client, uh, publicly available? And if not, are there any public library that you would recommend? Or do we have to reinvent the wheel? Um, first of all, in terms of WebSocket servers, there's many implementations of them. My implementation, which I designed to be good for embedding inside game engines, is available right now in my GitHub repository. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. Cool. So I see you mentioned the, the possibility of using video codecs. Uh, one of the attendees asked the, the opposite question. Uh, would it make sense to, to use non-compressed images so that the engine doesn't have to spend time uh, uh, compressing the frame buffer? Uh, or do you think, is there any uh, problem with that? Um, I think it really depends on your use case. Uh, I could see in some situations sending uncompressed data might be a CPU win, but it, it certainly will never be a bandwidth win. Um, and in, as I showed in my slides, even at 64K per frame, which is a huge compression over the uncompressed frame buffer, we're still looking at 2 megabytes per second to run at 30, 30 hertz. So hmm. that just seems not very feasible uh, unless bandwidth really shoots up. Okay. So uh, another question. Was your original implementation based on regular HTTP requests? And if so, did you see any practical benefits to the upgrade to WebSockets? And can you highlight the advantages and disadvantages of using WebSockets over uh, regular HTTP requests? Uh, I never uh, implemented this based on HTTP requests. My server can handle a single HTTP request, and that's just the upgrade to WebSocket. So I'm, my server kind of pretends to be an HTTP server, but it can only do one thing, which is switch over to WebSockets. I've already highlighted a lot of the benefits of WebSocket versus HTTP. The first is that it supports bidirectional communication uh, natively, so both the client and the server can be sending each other messages. Second, it's uh, the extra overhead of sending a WebSocket message is smaller than sending an HTTP message. And 
also related to that is parsing WebSocket headers is very simple and doesn't require any string processing, whereas parsing an HTTP header does. Okay, so a question from Mike Acton. Uh, why a separate ID instead of automatically hashing command uh, in order to create the ID? Uh, do you reuse the same command names? And I'd like to also add a related question. Have you looked at uh, into using JSONP to deal with JSON callbacks as opposed uh, to the ID matchup? Uh, I didn't consider hashing the objects, but that's definitely uh, a possibility. Although with hashing, there is the very rare chance that there's a collision, whereas just using a monotonically increasing number uh, and making sure that it never wraps around uh, has worked reasonably well. I'm not familiar with JSONP, so I'd have to look into it. Um, maybe Mike can further elaborate on what JSONP is. Oh, that's that's not a question from Mike. It's from another attendee. Oh. Uh, I lost track of who it was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's James Taylor. Okay. Yes. So uh, I'm not familiar with JSONP, so I fortunately I couldn't answer that. Yeah, I don't know about that either. So if uh, James wants to elaborate a little bit more, he can just send an additional question. In the meantime, um, another question is, do you think it's practical to have multiple designers uh, interacting with the same game concurrently using this uh, this system? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, that was one of my design motivations, was allowing multiple people to be connecting to a single instance of the game. The only issue that you have to work look out for is if people are editing the same object and maybe their uh, settings might get lost um, due to ordering of uh, network messages, how they arrive and things like that. Okay, so let me see if there's any other question. So how long did it take to implement this system? Uh, I've been working on this for a couple months now. Uh, I have been I've been building a WebSocket server, and as the protocol changed, so that took a little while. But now that it finalized, uh, it's been about two months of working on what I've been showing here. Okay, have you thought about using native client for the uh, for the client? Yeah, I'm actually pretty interested in playing around with native client. My biggest concern with native client right now is that my engine itself is built on Direct 3D11, and I don't know if it's possible to to use native client and work with Direct 3D. So that that's my biggest concern. But I think it would be kind of cool to take my engine and port it to native client and then embed it and then have the web application kind of sitting around the native application. OK. So I just got a response from Mike Acton saying that uh, there implementation is based on HTTP, so if someone is interested uh, in, in that route, they could uh, go to his talk, which I think uh, is tomorrow, but I'll have to uh, check that out. Yeah, it's, it's tomorrow afternoon, I think. Yes, yeah, so it's tomorrow, and it will be the last talk of the day at 15 Pacific time, uh, 6 p.m. European time, oh, sorry, East Coast, uh, 9 p.m. GMT, or uh, I guess 12 p.m. European time. Okay, so that's me tonight. Wow. Okay, so um, I think there are no more questions. Um, just let me take a look at the question window. So there's another question from John Rick. He says, you mentioned faster iterations, but in my experience, whatever I, whenever I add a feature to a web app, I need to modify the engine code as well. Hence, the iterations aren't that much faster, except when I'm working on the UI. 
Uh, that's a that's a fair point, actually. Um, I found that uh, adding the support in the engine on the you know on the C plus plus side, you know, for example, with video streaming, uh, it took about two hours uh, to get the you know to capture the frame buffer to use Turbo JPEG to encode the JPEG image and send it over the network, and then it took me about five minutes to get that running in the web application. So in some sense, yes, you'll still be tied to uh, implementing it on the C++ side, but I guess what I'm thinking is that eventually the set of commands exposed by your engine will stabilize and the web applications will uh, just you know, it'll just require writing the web application logic itself, and you won't always be adding um, new support for new commands on the C++ side. So the question is, can I ask, uh, once data is edited, runtime, how is it saved? Where and how does that feed back into the game? Is it saved locally in the browser or remotely in the server? So uh, the server holds all the state. The, the game engine itself holds all the state uh, and the web application is just sending commands to modify that state. Okay. Um, another question from Mike. Have you experimented with Node.js? Uh, no, I haven't, um, but it, it seems pretty cool. It's something to put on the list. Okay, so Final question. Um, so, how do you uh, handle input events in order to interact with three D meshes, for example? Um, so, if if you're rendering them locally, then uh, they don't need to go over. But for the remote viewer, I just you know hooked into the JavaScript. Well, first of all, in the remote viewer, I currently don't support mouse events right now because. I'm waiting for the mouse graph support to show up in Chrome in a couple months. But for keyboard presses, I just capture the keyboard events on, in the JavaScript application and send over uh, commands back to the uh, engine. Okay, so another question from Mike. Uh, do you guys support cross-server requests uh, to a central server on the game? Um, sorry, can you say the question again? Uh, do you support cross-server requests, for example, to a central server and the game? Uh, currently, no. Uh, each, each game engine instance uh, is running in isolation. Uh, web applications can communicate through the engine uh, by using it as a hub, but I haven't explored having the turning the uh, engines themselves into nodes that connect to each other. Okay, another question from Paul. Uh, what in-game HTTP server lib are you using? One, did you, did you write it from scratch? Or is it Mongoose or any other? Uh, so my game, uh, the server doesn't actually do any HTTP other than the single HTTP request to upgrade to WebSocket. Mm -hmm. And so I've written my own WebSocket server, which you can find in my GitHub repository if you're interested. Okay. So another question, how can asset processing uh, be integrated in this system? Basically, how, do, how would you integrate offline tools in this system? Well, so I, my thinking is that the offline tools would become a service or like a, you know, operate in similar to a, a Unix daemon. Uh, so they're, they're always running there and they're receiving connections from uh, designers uh, through web applications and getting uh, assets to be processed, submitted through WebSocket. Um, and then it gets you know, it's running in the background on these servers, and then when it's completed, a message goes back to the to the web application. So turning this asset processing into more of a service that can be run in the background uh, on a separate server farm. 
Okay, so um, do you think it's practical to build a complete uh, world editor as a web tool, or is it better to use a native client for that? Uh, I think that it is practical. Um, I don't know what would be better, um, but it's definitely practical, and I, I plan on building a, a full uh, world editor around this system. Okay. So uh, how does uh, the web app load all its resources if there's no HTTP server, like CSS files, images, etc.? Oh, so if you, the web app could be hosted on an HTTP server, uh, but right now I don't have any need for that, so the web app is just hosted on my local file system. Okay. Can you uh, read out aloud or uh, basically share your screen so that people can uh, take a look at the GitHub uh, address where they can find your source code? Uh, I don't have a link to it in the no. slides, but it's just if you just Google GitHub in my name, uh, I, I don't think any other links will show up. Okay. 